Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Because Money and this is going to be a love letter to emergency funds. Everyone agrees that emergency funds are going to be a great thing, which is actually a really hard thing to do because not everyone agrees about anything in this world, and particularly not when it comes to finances and personal finance, but really everything is personal. We're going to be talking about emergency funds, how they can fit your life, what to do in an emergency, and whether or not you can give yourself permission to draw from that emergency fund. So too long, didn't listen, emergency funds are great, start saving for one just in case. If you want to help support the podcast and continued real conversations about money like this, please visit patreon.com slash because money, where you can donate some of your hard-earned money to help keep this going. Thanks for listening, and here's the episode. I think we've all been through emergencies of one kind or another. I think we have some really more than just... Um, well, I'll withdraw it from your emergency fund because that's obviously the answer, right? Like, well, I'll withdraw it from your emergency fund. Well, that's the correct answer. The problem is, is just like, <laughs> it's just like, okay, if not step one, question mark. <laughs> now we build the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. And that made it like, look like it was really like just a ziggurat, but it's not. It's an algorithm. <laughs> fun fact 90% of algorithms are ziggurats. Yeah, well, that's true. That seems high. Listen, fun facts in general. Uh, never mind. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. Peace. <laughs> also, yeah. hello. But that is that is like there's so many things in finance that get like the everybody wants to say the right answer, especially like if you're looking at a public forum. It's like, oh, what do you do if you're this? Oh, this is the right answer. Emergency funds or build an emergency fund. But like if emergencies are generally one of the big triggers. Like the one of the triggers being like, oh, oh shit, I need to do something about my finances. So therefore, perhaps the tools are not built <laughs> to do the ideal situation and talking about it is probably super patronizing or mildly patronizing. Mildly, mildly. Okay, so, well, it, well, it depends on if you're actually patronizing when you talk about it. That's fair. Right? No, I, I mean, just like stopping there. Like, obviously, it's part of the tool. I don't mean that, you know, you can't talk about the actual solutions and how to kind of like, um, I always like to, I really like the analogy of plugging the dike. You know, like, if, if there's a problem, part of the problem has to be like, trying to make sure the problem doesn't happen again. Like, this is the whole, we should really talk about specific emergencies at some point, because it's hard to talk generally about emergencies when emergencies are massively different from emergency to emergency. But like, if it's if it's one of these like giant, or even just giant to your own life kind of spending problems that kind of comes out of nowhere and just kind of destroys your monthly cash flow or your just like your ability to buy groceries or whatever it is, you know, that kind of plugging the dike thinking is useful at some point to be like, okay, how can, how can we start thinking about how this might not happen again instead of just getting back on your feet? But yeah, well, and then, and then, I mean, often I can think of, you know, the emergency that I have many examples for. I, you know, you're somewhere on the spectrum of like, a, this isn't the thing, this isn't the thing that, or the catalyst that, that made me, think oh boy I should do something about my finances it was like well I'm doing things I'm doing the things and now this happens and the things that I was doing are not I'm just not at the I wasn't ready yet <laughs> so if we could have rescheduled this I get my people to call your people we'll do this 18 months from now yeah Soon. totally yeah. totally so yeah that's that's a funny thing to think about I sometimes think about that when uh when I think about the getting audited which wouldn't be an emergency but it would be a not my favorite thing because I'm not seven years from getting my shit together. <laughs> it just would be a lot of work. It's not like there's like deep, dark secrets there. I don't know. I know there's not anything crazy there. It's just like, just not there yet. Just give me more years. <laughs> than... Listen, May, 2020. That's when you can audit me. No. We can throw you a party. Like, oh, auditable. 21 or 22. That's, I don't think 20. I don't, I'm not super comfortable with 20. <laughs> we just won't pass that number along. Okay. I'm going to tell you the thing here. Let's start with, here's some advice that everybody on, well, I'm not going to say that maybe everybody online would, but so one of the things that I had to do in an emergency in the past was capitalize three of my mortgage payments. Hmm. And it wasn't like a, a menu button on the website at the bank. 
I knew that I could do it because I had worked at the bank, but it's a pretty, I want to swear a lot right now. It, it was a pretty hard number to find. You can't just call the mortgage department and be like, hey, uh, so my husband, his boss didn't pay him and then he didn't pay him and then he didn't pay him. So what can we do about that? <laughs> so you find the secret number and you tell them all the secret things. Oh, I've capitalized the payments on my mortgage before. So was, by capitalize, you mean that you did not pay the mortgage and then you just had the amount added back to the principal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was super. That was three life-saving months right there. And it's not an enormous mortgage. Like we don't have a $5,000 a month mortgage or anything, but that was one of the things we had to do. That was, it wasn't like the first thing on the list, like, oh, emergency, capitalize the mortgage, <laughs> and nor should it be. Um, but it was one of those things that was I knew you could do. I mean, you can do it kind of, once every mortgage so if you if we ever renegotiate our mortgage maybe we could do it again sometime i don't know that's not a thing that's in my calendar um but it was definitely one of the things on my list of okay in an emergency break the glass and do this thing yeah. so. um i was very fortunate as a young adult to have a few very minor emergencies um which sort of got me into the mindset of preparing for this at a very healthy young age uh, so shortly after I moved out, um, first off, again, to speak to my own luck with my family and situation, my dad gave me the oldest car in the family to take to London with me when I moved out. Uh, so this was a 1997 uh, Toyota Accord, no, Honda, Toyota, Honda Accord, uh, in pretty decent shape, but still to use car. It's getting up there in years. And then shortly after I move out, there's a problem with it. I can't remember which problem came first. There were quite a number of problems with that car in the end. Uh, but I think it was a wheel bearing wet and that was like a thousand dollars to replace. Mm -hmm. And so a thousand dollars is not too much money to go crying back to dad and be like, hey dad, the car's broken. They say it's a thousand dollars to fix. Do you think you can help me? So like I had a very easy backup plan there which is that I barely moved out and I just asked my dad for help. Um, and then, you know, the realization is like, this is a used car. This is going to keep happening. Just things are going to keep breaking on it. Like it's not going to get more reliable as it goes from like eight years old to nine years old. Like that's just not going to happen. And so then I'm like, okay, I need to build into my budget. Like it doesn't happen every month, but at some point this car is going to need repairs. At some point I'm going to have to change the oil. I don't do it every month, but at some point through the year, that's got to happen or the engine is going to seize on me in a couple of years, et cetera, et cetera. And then I had another set of very minor cash flow emergencies where the HR department uh, decided that I didn't work there anymore. <laughs> and they did. Uh, they just didn't give me my paycheck. And it took three months. And then I finally got all the back pay at once. But there's three months with no oh, cash really? coming. And once again, it's like, well, how do I pay for this? Well, at that point, I'd already had the car repair issue. So I had an emergency fund started. So then I started spending out of the emergency fund. So I used the emergency fund to pay for my groceries. And I knew I had to backstop beyond the emergency fund because my dad's like, are you okay for money? Like, I can give you money if you... And so, I mean, he was always there for me. So I was never like super worried in this situation. Like, how am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to eat? Like I had the emergency fund, but then I had my dad and then eventually I got the money. Yeah. But it, it just goes to show, like it can be a really stupid little thing. Like you didn't lose your job. They just didn't pay you. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of federal... Uh, uh, civil servants have faced this with the whole Phoenix pay disaster that's uh, going on right now. Oh, golly. That's, maybe that's kind of one of the things that always comes up when this kind of conversation happens on a bigger level is that emergency dictates like this, like it's an emergency, something huge happens. But that's not a huge thing. And like it's hard. Neither of them are huge. Well, but it, the impacts can be like the same as a huge thing. And, and even what you're talking about, Sandy, about just like, just, you're just not getting paid for whatever reason, you know, for months at a time, whether you're working there, both times people are working there. It's, but like, it's a different kind of thing. It's not like I lost my job and I can't get a new one. It's like, no, I have my job, but I'm not getting paid for it for whatever reason. Like it's, I feel like it's, that's not what people think about when they think about emergencies. Cause that's not, like there just needs to be another word that or at least kind of a, another term that helps people kind of think about what the context of this of kind of what's being talked about and we can talk about like actual giant but the effects are the same it doesn't matter on the effects end and that's yeah, the suddenly you have more expenses or suddenly you have less income 
without really, you know, getting a chance to prepare for it necessarily, except for preparing in general for it. Is that kind of how, is, is there a, a, a room for an oversimplification there? Is like, is that the result of like a financial result of the vast majority of emergencies? Suddenly you have less income or more expenses? Yeah. Right. And then on top of that is just, but yeah, I absolutely agree. That's a great way to simplify it. And then on top of that, depending on the emergency, you can also have a boatload of emotional stress. So, you know, like my car breaking down is not a hugely emotional moment for me. That was relatively purely financial, yeah. not getting paid relatively purely financial because I still had, you know, my quote unquote job, like grad student, RA, whatever, but I still had that. Yeah. Um, if you actually lose your job, then it's also a lot of stress on top of the financial constraint. If someone gets sick and is in the hospital, you have a lot of emotional issues and baggage to deal with on top of all of that. So, although thing- I would say I would say that people like, I mean, if you were prepared and you had an emergency fund and you have the backstop of family or good support otherwise, then no, you know, your car breaking down isn't a huge stress. But I would say, you know, given the same circumstance, but a different person in a different, you know, set of surrounding circumstances, that could be as emotionally stressful for that person as having a loved one in the hospital might be for somebody else, right? Yeah, that's true. If you don't, if you don't have that way of dealing with it then yeah absolutely then even though it's a purely financial stress it that can be a lot of stress yeah which is why the idea of having a triage plan like okay so step one let's you know hopefully we have the emergency fund we draw on it step two whatever that algorithm is the idea to me that or the real appeal of, of it is that in one of those very stressful situations depending on the person and the circumstances when your ability to make good decisions is eroded because you have to keep, you're making a lot of decisions or you're in something really stressful, you already have something to which you can go and say, okay, I already know, I, I stop those, my automatic transfers to this thing, I can stop that for the month and I, you know, we'll, we'll just cut really way back on spending because we know how to do that because we've practiced that before and I can withdraw this from the savings account and I can, you know, like all those things that you can put together that just become, because you've practiced it, like a, a who are those people that, Yeah, like a fire drill. I was was gonna come up with some athletic metaphor. No, fire drill, that's the one. (laughs) That's way better. Fire drill is really good. (laughs) Because the fire is also an emergency. I nailed it. I said the thing that everybody knew already, but I said it out loud. (laughs) With confidence too. You're welcome, folks. There's a certain thing, like when when one resource really depletes and there's like a hole, because I, I always I really like thinking about the idea that you, you know money, time, and energy, and we're just balancing these three resources all the time. And so when there's a real hit to one, let's say it's a financial one, but I, I could say that there you could actually draw draw kind of a parallel to an emergency being a demand on any one of these three. You know, a health emergency in your family may not directly affect your finances, but it affects your time or energy in a huge way. It becomes an emergency that can affect your finances because one thing balances out the other. So if you've got a shortage of time that relative to your normal life, you often need to spend more money to get yourself to a balanced, not balanced in the I'm amazing thing, balanced in the get through the day thing. Um, Or if you have less energy, you're going to be doing things like eating out more often. Like it's just, and that's not, you're a terrible person. It's just, that's how that balance works. And so I think that it might be interesting to kind of just, I think it's interesting to look at that idea of emergencies through that lens to say, yeah, okay. You know, what does uh, a car that doesn't work has multiple kind of hits on that. So for somebody that has a has a commute into their job all the time and it's really important and their day is just like so scheduled that it has to work out this way and they've got to pick up their kids at a certain time and drop them off and all of a sudden they've lost this thing. It's an insane, like the stress is quite large. It's like all of a sudden they have to pay to make sure their kids can get to school or they have to rent a car or they have to like, they're losing work time. Like they, there's ways that all of these things affect one another. And, and maybe even a, an emergency fund, it, it's not even purely, or emergency plan, a triage plan, is not just about the financial side. It's taking care of that financial side. It's sometimes the easiest, uh, the most, the easiest just to say, I have a fund of money, because it's harder to have a fund of time and a fund <laughs> of energy, you know? Not impossible. I, I think that there's got to be a way to schedule your life so that there's enough 
flexibility and downtime to absorb unexpected events so that you can move things around and, and kind of fold it in. But it's the same general idea that if you have more than you need of these three resources, and you're kind of operating below capacity, that's the idea of emergency fund, you're putting some away that you're not spending right now. When crazy stuff happens that really affects one of those balances, no matter what it is, you can apply one of those extra things from another, another area. Yeah. Yeah. And it's when, so when, when you're talking about like having a $30,000 emergency fund, then it sounds cuckoo crazy pants. because It's so enormous. But when you think about actually using what you would actually have to use that money for, um, to replace because you can't because you can't keep a store of time and you can't keep a store of energy. So if you have to replace any time and any energy that you need to just deal with this, plus you need to replace the income. Completely. All that I mean, that's one of the lovely things about money being a tool. You can use it to buy time. You can use it to buy energy. But if you don't have it in the first place, then well, that just goes down a whole other rabbit hole. Well, well, then you need to really be supplying these things from the time and energy side then those are the things that you're paying for everything with. So like if you don't have extra money, then you are trying to find extra time to either make more money or to try to do all the things or extra energy. And those things are, those things are harder. There's hard caps on time and energy more than there are for other things. And, and you can kind of go into a crisis mode, this kind of like superhuman thing where you can burn the candle at both ends and people do. And that's like, that's a real legitimate way of dealing with things. But can you do that for three months or six months or, you know, then you start having health things being an issue. I'm just thinking about, um, Sandy, we're, we're, somebody had sent out that, um, list of stressful things. Oh, that's right. That, that kind of effect of the list of stressful things. And I think that it's so interesting here. I've got it right here. So it's just talking about like life events and kind of there, it puts a, a value on, on kind of what it is, but just really like kind of the most stressful things, everything from death of a spouse being the most stressful things to divorce, to um, separation, jail things. And then at the bottom, looking at things like major holidays, vacation, yep. you know. Finished, finished a certification. <laughs> totally, <laughs> for <laughs> just a random example. Just like what? No. You know, a major change in anything from like, um, mm -hmm. Not getting together with your family, sleeping habits, eating habits, looking at this idea, I think that you could probably draw a really clear correlation between kind of these things that upset your life, emergency or no, or positive or negative, and their effect on your management of your core resources. You know, maybe, or am I kind of, am I trying to connect things that aren't connected? No, I don't think that they're, I don't think that they're, though they're very clearly connected. The, I guess the, the thing that is so wide and broad to me, which is just, you know, become a better human person is the answer. Like I don't have, oh, I, you know, my time and my energy levels and my money, none of them are, it's just, it, it, it's simpler to look at just the money part of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Completely. Like, my, I, I'm going to build an emergency fund. I have this kind of triage plan for when things, you know, the expenses or the income don't balance out for me for whatever reason. Everything else, this is going to be a sad commentary on me. Everything else goes into the pile marked become a better human person. <laughs> I, yeah, I know what you mean. And, and it can kind of be wiped off that way. I guess I think that like, if we're trying to look at triage, like, I, I feel like one of the first steps is just recognizing the impact that this has on your entire life, not your bank balance. And I just look what John said yeah. before. It's just that the first thing it's, it, for me, it's just more about permission. It's not about if you had been a better human, this wouldn't have happened. This is like, it's the same thing from the financial or the energy or the time side. I just think that the first thing has to be like, look at the cost. This is going to have an effect on your life. Yeah. You know, whether it's a car or divorce or the death of a loved one. This is going to have a huge effect on your life, on how you spend your time and your energy and your money. So like that has to be recognized so that you can just take stock. And, and also like the ideal situation for financial planning in general is that that first step of taking stock can take as long as you need it to take. Like that's the dream, right? Is that you have enough cushion so that you don't have to do that on day two because that's such I, that's that's got that's just impossible yeah 
Do you know, I wonder how many people, this is related. I wonder how many people don't actually withdraw from an emergency fund mm. for things that in their mind they said, okay, an emergency is this, this, or this. It's not any of these things. I would rather go through the stress. I built that it's there but it took so long to build it or it's in my mind if I withdraw from that, that in itself is an emergency. Forget about what I needed to withdraw from in the first place. And so I would rather live on the edge and like really just stress myself out in order to avoid that next failure, which is withdrawing from the emergency fund. I sus I know that the seeds are there. For my I would feel that way. I have felt that way. I've withdrawn from emergency funds and felt like, oh man, trouble comes in threes. <laughs> That's really interesting. And maybe, maybe that's one of the things, you know, we've talked in the past about, um, you know, investment policy, IP, IPS, yeah. IP, what's the IPS? And yeah. So the idea of like, this is what we do. When things go wrong, this is what I do. When things go right, this is what I do. And then we talked about, or you guys talked about with Preet, the idea of a cash flow statement, the idea of like, okay, this is the plan. If this happens, this is what I do. This happens, what I do. I think that it's a really good thing. If you're going to build up a cushion, if you've decided that that's something that, that really, Oh, we convinced you, you did it. And I have a little bit of something to kind of start that, like coming up with an idea of like, what's it for like determining like, to, and like writing it down so that you can give yourself permission to be like, no, no, this is for this kind of situation. I'm going to start saying situation instead of emergency for the rest of the episode and being annoyed. Um, but like this is for this kind of situation. And so then you can make that call in the moment. And maybe that would help a little bit to be like, it's for this and it's not for this. It's not for if all of a sudden I want a nicer blank. Right. It's for if this or this or this or this happens, because this is what I'm really scared of. And, and you know, kind of really determining that might be a, a useful thing. Because I think you're completely, I could totally see that happening with lots of people with all the work that it takes to kind of build up a fund. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so to me, the pra practicing what you do, it goes back to that giving yourself permission and taking stock piece that you were talking about in a way. Doing that ahead of time, I really do. I have a, like, a, of course, I've got a spreadsheet. It's, of course, color-coded. And there are things on it that, like, okay, step one, this. Step two, this. Step three. And then later on, it, it gets back down to, like, calling the mortgage department or whatever. But, like, it's a pretty long yeah. list of things that are no thought required. That's just the next thing that I would do not because I'm special, but because I've had to use it a number of times. You're special. Yeah, super special. <laughs> Sorry, John, I interrupted you. What were you going to say? Uh, so I was, I was just going to say, like, when it's an emergency that's on that list, then, yeah, you got the permission to pull from the emergency fund. What happens when it's not? When it's a situation, again, not an emergency, but a situation that comes up, and you're like, okay, well, this wasn't really an emergency. Do I have permission to pull from my emergency fund? Or do I carry this on my credit card? And I, I actually saw... This is a couple of years ago now, but a person who ran into that, uh, where she got invited to a destination wedding that was not in her vacation budget and plan. And she's like, well, this is my friend. I really don't want to miss out on it, but it's going to be, you know, whatever it was, three grand to fly out and go to this wedding. And I got it. Uh, it's like, well, if I don't pull for my emergency fund, then it's going to sit on my credit card for, because that's like, that's where I have the money. So like, it feels really bad to pull for my emergency fund. I'm not going to be able to, like, in this case, it was the TFSA. I'm not going to be able to pull that, put that money back in the TFSA for another year. Like, is is this you know and i'm like well i mean it's that or you pay a huge amount of interest on the credit card and either way that's going to be bad and uh you know how's that going to work i'm you know this is before shannon lee simmons worry free money came up that might be a good framework for analyzing it and making the decision but uh you know what do you do in, in those types of situations where it's not one of those emergencies but it's still going to save you interest on a credit card if you pull from your emergency fund yeah i think that that's like that's a great question and it's it i think maybe shannon lee simmons has an example that is exactly that possibly <laughs> so like <laughs> it's that it's actually that scenario <laughs> like i think it might be the same person but uh she's got a great destination wedding example but i think that like there the, the overarching question of like if it's not in there, you still got this money. So it's, then you've got this like debt or savings kind of where do I draw from question. And there's, there's multiple ways you can look at that. Like there's the numbers way, which is really kind of clear. It's like, it costs you more here. But then I think it gets really more interesting when you look at the next level to be like, look, 
what is your capacity for kind of paying that down? What are the trade-offs actually? What are the capacity for replacing the emergency fund? What are the capacity for paying off the credit card? What is the capacity? What is your kind of like sense of, okay, so if it's going to take you a year to replace it, what's your sense of how the next year looks? Like you're not going to know, you're not going to be able to see the emergencies, but like if you're like thinking about changing jobs in two months, maybe that's something that should make you a little nervous. Um, I think maybe the the extra pressure and the kind of like uh, anxiety of having a credit card balance helps you pay it off faster. Maybe a split in between two of them is something that might be an option. You know, it's it, it really kind of does depend on the person. Like I know that the number answer is completely correct. Um, Shannon does have a great way of just kind of like breaking down this idea because we talked about this in the episode that we did with her, this idea of safe and happy. And one thing that she put through the lens is the idea of being happy today and happy a year from now. So like, I think that with the destination wedding example, she actually ran two destination wedding examples. One of, one of somebody who was like really excited to go. And one of somebody who was like, I, it's a relation. I feel like I should go, but I don't really. So the idea of like, okay, so it might make you happy now, but in the 12 month period, is it going to make you happier to kind of like be $3,000 less in your emergency fund? Like, are you going to be really like, I'm so glad I went. So there's, I don't know, there's multiple things to kind of work through. And I, I don't think that you can like worksheet everything out beforehand. Be like, oh, and if I get invited to a destination wedding, then I shall, oh, and this is how I, okay. Yeah. Like it's, the ziggurat has, has limitations. Not many, but that's definitely one of them. <laughs> What if it's you and, and there's also like a second level that goes on top of that. So let's say that you, you know, run the simple math and you're like, okay, well, drawing from the emergency fund is going to save me a butt ton of credit card in interest. So yeah, that, that makes very simple, easy financial sense. And I'm going to go no matter what, because I've gone through my safe, happy, whatever, and I'll be able to fill backfill that. Yeah. But then what's the second level, which is, have you now given yourself permission to pull from your emergency fund for any damn thing? And hundred percent, and and that's a question: Is paying the credit card interest a penalty that's worth it to enforce the behavior of not doing this very often, or um, you know? And when you do it, can you reinforce your mind that this is a one-time thing, and one-time things are going to be rarer than this? And if it starts happening more often, then I need to reevaluate my vacation savings or whatever it is. I have a new favorite word. And it's fungible. It's excellent. And a, a friend of mine was talking about it specifically in relation to finance. I can't remember what book he was reading, um, but talking about this idea that, you know, it, it's a really good tool in personal finance to assign categories and jobs and uh, just kind of building little baskets around this money is for this, this money is for this, this money is for this. It's helpful. It's it's really helpful for me and I think it's helpful for lots of people. But he was making the point that we do forget that money is money and money is fungible. Money is able to be, it's just money. You can move it from basket to basket. Like this is totally possible. It's completely okay. But I, I, you do get to make the rules around that. And I guess my kind of uh, one piece of input on that would just be just making sure that you're, kind of making your own rules that you're not trying to get sucked into like oh i should have six months of salary in my emergency fund and anything less is failure you know um because you're right you and you're both i think that that's something i hadn't thought about before that idea of like giving yourself permission to take it out and defining what is a situation that warrants that and maybe nothing does because maybe when the situation comes you're like oh well no i can just stress it out and you're like this is for actually making these situations better you know, and to feel a little bit less insane. But I, I think that you do have to figure out what is what, because otherwise you can just like every situation, because challenging some people is really useful. I know that in, in case of mine, like something happens, oh, that's a good excuse to just like slim down here and not touch that sum of money, because you know what, I can actually make it through. Mm. But maybe that's stupid sometimes, because maybe that does mean that I'm putting extra stress on myself that would have been alleviated by the, oh man. We're going to not come up with any answers again. All right. I put more variables and more things to consider. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> I have <laughs> several more variables. <laughs> so, so far we've been mostly talking about, okay, you're going to run into some emergency situation. Yeah. 
pull from the emergency fund. And then the default plan is you're going to keep working and saving money and filling the emergency fund back up that way. What happens if the emergency is bigger and you have to start pulling from other baskets of money? Again, money is fungible. You can pull out of your RSP or your TFSA that's 100%. earmarked for long-term retirement savings. At what point do you start tapping that money to backfill your emergency fund or to pay your current expenses after your emergency fund's depleted? Like, how do you approach that? And I, well, have, have we talked about like your actual things you have to pay for yet? Like, have we sold the house yet? Or <laughs> are we selling the house before RSPs? I'm no, I'm not saying that. But like, I, wrote it down. I already wrote it down. It's in pen. <laughs> but it's too late. It's on. It's on the ziggurat. We're done. Yeah. We sold the house. No, it it gets. I I guess I was just talking to somebody a little while ago. Um, I, I I mentioned this to Sandy before, but their kind of emergency is a really kind of it's it's mental health based, and they just it's a real struggle right now to just work. So it's, it's sometimes they can work, sometimes they can't, they don't know when they can, they don't know when it's going to be possible and when it's not going to be possible. Expenses are high. There's quite a bit of kind of debt that's been pulled in from the past. Um, and that can't be wiped away with an easy solution like bankruptcy and consumer reports for, for various reasons. And, you know, I was talking to them and it just, and, and maybe this is one of those situations where you say things and maybe that makes me a bad financial planner. Like you get that little, like, it's like that, you know, you shouldn't pay off your credit card right away. You should stabilize your life thing. And it, every time I get the alarm, I'm like, oh, that seems like the wrong numbers example. But like for this kind of thing to be like her, the, you know, health has to be the most important thing in that situation. Like in my mind, when I look at it, I'm like, you need to do everything you can to be okay right now. Because what otherwise, what trying to maintain all these side things and even maintaining, you know, credit report and maintaining kind of like, you know, I don't know what might happen there, but it doesn't matter as much as her being okay and to trying to do whatever it takes to, to do that. So when you talk about that idea of like, you know, when I don't know, but do you draw on other assets? I think in some situations, Yes. Like I think in some situations, immediate needs have to be taken care of and things can get really bad without an idea of what's going to happen next. But like, are you really going to sit there and ask somebody to not touch their RSPs when they don't know how they're going to get through the next week? Uh, that's, that's crazy, right? Yes. I mean, look, okay. Because I think what we're fighting against is, the, is this idea of, you know, an, an optimal life, an optimal financial life is somebody who doesn't withdraw from their RSPs. Yeah, it's, right? it's, yeah, it's funny. It's like that classic, like Dave Chilton, you know, wealthy barber, him talking about how like, you know, that's his whole thing. You never touch your RSPs. But then when he was putting out his book, didn't he withdraw his RSPs to publish his book? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but like it had happens it's just like because real life is not a thing like it's not directly like the rules are great until they're not until they don't apply yeah and so but here we are in this territory that you and i both love to be in and john yeah. does not love which is like <laughs> well it could be anything it's but it depends on the person how do you feel which is true it feels totally true and valid except for that it doesn't it's very difficult to then turn into a cigarette <clears throat> and actually is i mean there is there certainly are times when somebody might be saying and i don't this is not it's not for me to say but i there i think we we worry a little bit about creating too loose of like this okay well it depends on your health is important well except for those people who are just going to say my health is important but they're going to do dumb stuff i don't know how to explain that no, i'm no, like dummy but no, no, it, because there are situations where people are like, no, where it seems from the outside, this is all that can be said, that, right. that health is enough to do more than they're doing. And yet the prioritization seems out of whack. It's tough to say, you know, it's, it, and that's where you kind of start to encourage people from the outside to be like, no, no, you can increase your context. You can increase your scope of things to worry about. But we talked about before the idea of financial planning. It's like, 
as your capacity, kind of mental capacity, financial quantity grows, it you gain the ability to stretch out your context, right? Yeah. So like financial health gives you the ability to think in 30 year stretches. But when you're in just the beginning part of it, you're thinking about today, you're thinking about this week, you're thinking about this month, kind of thinking about different chunks. And I think that can shrink in emergency. Isn't that fair that sometimes the demands of, of the scope of, of an emergency can say, I can't worry about me in 35 years. You know, I need to start worrying about me in a week. But I, I will say that, you know, however feeling me, you know, it depends you, we can be, and it's totally true. I think that having a structure and having, because this is the idea of how we talk about the you know, emergency triage, the idea of like, how do I even start thinking through these kinds of things? And I think that your question is totally fair and, and great john about just being like when rsps like when does that come in when does the tfsa come in when does your house become something that's on the table you know is there a way that you should you know is it too easy to generalize liquid assets registered assets you know real assets it, it it is uh, hard to generalize that. I mean, I'll, I'll go from my own situation yeah. here. I mean, I probably dredged this example up a little too much over the past couple of episodes of the podcast. But I mean, Kelly got very sick and I had an emergency fund. I wasn't super stressed about what was going to happen over the next few days. Like she goes into the hospital. And I'm just like logging into my bank and I'm just like 200 bucks to each of my bill pays. Like at least I'm not going to get late payments. And if I miss checking a bill, I'm going to be okay. Uh, transfer some money from the emergency savings fund into the checking account so it's there ready. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm like, you know, this is a long-term problem now. You know, she's not going right back to work after she gets out of the hospital. And I hadn't burned through my emergency fund yet, but I'm like, okay, now I'm probably going to need a bigger emergency fund. So even though I hadn't burned through it yet, I still had like a couple of months of emergency fund sitting there. I was like, I'm probably going to need more. And my second level emergency fund in my mind is my investment. So if I, I've got my TFSA, it's, you know, invested in a very high equity al allocation because I'm a risk tolerant investor with a long timeline. Well, now I'm like, maybe not all that money has that long timeline. So then I reduced my equity exposure, pulled some of that. I didn't pull it out of the TFSA, but I pulled it back out of equities into uh, cash and bonds so that if I ran out of my emergency fund, I know that, okay, I've got my second level here in my TFSA and I'm ready to pull that out. And I mean, that's just how I approached it, but. It, that's <laughs> no, but that's such a right away. Like that's the most actionable advice that's come from the entire time we've talked. Like it's that, you know, whether or not that's exactly what to do, but that is, that is a structured way to kind of think through these things. And you knew, and so like, you know what, I like the idea that you know that like, yeah, this is my fund first. And the next thing is this. And the next thing is this. And, you know, and probably family support is somewhere in that kind of, uh, you know, list of things, but knowing that these are kind of your things. And so knowing at first, you know, when it gets to a certain level and when you knew that the long-term grew, taking a look at this and changing them, because the algorithm changes when you learn more about the emergency. You know, because it's in the moment there, there really is, I think with lots of emergencies, there's just a, you know, let's get through the next week thing, you know, not in the kind of extreme way we've been talking about, about selling everything and get through the next week. But like, but then as it grows to be like, it changes, you know, in your case, it's like, it changes all the formulas. It changes the formulas for, you know, your normal year. It changes your formula for your next 25 years. You need to look at kind of all the plans and kind of rejig them a little bit and be like, oh, okay, you know what and what are the first steps even if you can't know everything um what are the first steps that i can kind of do to be the most flexible as possible yes yeah <laughs> if you don't i mean it, it goes back to the, you you need to increase your flexibility so that i mean in the really basic answer it's you have to increase the amount of money that you have on hand so increase your flexibility and practice the things that you'll do that's it's, I mean, there's certainly something to draw towards the Olympics or athletics or something. There is, there's a metaphor there somewhere, but it, I mean, we want it to be this really unique to us. Hmm. And in some ways it can be, but very unique to us, complicated, this, then this, then this, then this, then this. But in some cases, there's a reason that the emergency fund is a really kind of classic piece of good advice 
because it fits most of those situations. Yeah. Right. That doesn't, it doesn't fit all the big ones, but so if you have an emergency fund and then a, a way to think about the next steps after that and the rules, yeah, for, you know, reduce my equity allocation, you know, do this and that and the other thing. I think that's as, I mean, I don't think you can go any further than that. If it's something, if it's going to be bigger than that, um, I mean, of course, now we're going to go into disability insurance, but if it's going to be bigger, if it's going to be so catastrophic that your emergency fund plus your kind of triage actions after that, plus any assets that you have to liquidate aren't going to cover it, then it really moves into, by definition, a catastrophic emergency that either is uninsurable against, there's been a huge landslide or whatever, who knows, yeah. um, or, uh, or there is insurance for it and hopefully you can get some of that. Ahead of time. Obviously. Also, also, there's the, the trade-offs then in terms of how much you want to, so you're sort of getting this hole and you're digging this hole deeper in terms of financial issues because you're just spending money, spending money, spending money without the income coming in. And so you can either backfill that hole, but with your savings, so you got this pile of savings and it's sort of depleting. And having that savings and having that sort of second level of savings lets you make that choice. So am I going to have to start cutting back my spending right now when I don't have the time and I don't have the energy to help compensate for that? Or am I going to let my emergency fund draw down and then in six months or a year, then I'm going to deal with how do I, you know, readjust my budget? Like I run the fire drill and I know that, okay, I cancel the cable and I downgrade my phone plan and I brown bag my lunch and whatever things that you're going to do. And I might get more extreme, like I need to downsize my house or whatever to make your balance budget balance under your new circumstances. But at least having those resources mean that you don't have to deal with that right at that moment. Yeah. Well, and I think that this is where just where the awareness of the fact of how these things interact is so important is that just that because the last thing you need in this situation is you beating yourself up for not doing more or you know you beating yourself up for not being able to brown bag your lunch because you're spending so much extra on blank it's like that takes a whole bunch of extra time and energy so like that's why i think it's so important just to just to, at the beginning and just in just kind of start rolling on your mind right away that that's what the cost is right away. Like, so that you're going into this being like, why would I think I would have extra energy to also change root behaviors in an emergency? Like, that's not a, that's not a reasonable thing to expect of myself. It's not a reasonable thing to expect of myself. Maybe other people are way better in an emergency, but like, it's not a reasonable thing to expect of myself. So just to start getting used to that practice, same thing, but just being like, this is a reasonable thing for me to expect of myself. And this is not. And this kind of gets into that, always bringing it back to my, like into my own zone of self-reflectiveness and self-awareness and all that stuff. But that's the idea of practice, right? Like, you know, you can go through kind of more playful exercises of stress testing your budget, just as a, a just as a, a general habit, just to be like, well, I like to think about the idea of playing the, the, the word of play instead of stress testing, which doesn't make me think of it as more fun, but just like, you know, what would happen if you spent a hundred dollars less on food every week, you know, or every month or something like that. Just what does that feel like? Is that super stressful for you? Or is that actually kind of easy? You know, is it easy to cancel a cable um, subscription for a couple of months or does that like cause a lot of stress in your house? I think that, that's just an interesting thing to know for your life in general, if you want to all of a sudden go into a mode where you're trying to save more or you're trying to kind of be in an emergency, the more things like that that you can know about you and your family, the more levers that you have. So it's like, you know, you don't want to go into an emergency and be like, okay, we're cutting all the stuff that we enjoy. It's like, oh, ah, you know, that doesn't work. But if you're like, no, 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 we've done this before. We know the things, we know how we can get our spending down $400 a month. We We've totally tried it. It's we know the recipes that we make. It's it's totally fine. I have an example. Shoot. Of clients who I don't know why they were my clients. They're so awesome. They don't need me. <laughs> <laughs> he halfway through the engagement, he lost his job. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what should we do here? Let's see. Well, let's not change anything. 
Um, right away when I lost my job, we changed our mortgage. We were aggressively repaying our mortgage. So we changed that. We went back to the 25 year amortization. Um, and I actually don't need any of the EI. We, we just went back to living on this budget that we had from a couple of years ago. So all the EI is just being saved up in our account. Also, we can still save $1,600 a month towards our goals. So how should we, how should we allocate that? That was the question. It wasn't, how do we deal with the emergency? It's like, how do we reallocate the savings that we're able to like, uh, uh, I almost blew up. It was amazing. I just, I love them dearly. But that's, that's exactly what you said before. You said increase flexibility and practice the things that you'll do. That's another way to increase flexibility if you don't have the capacity to save an emergency fund in a huge way. Like there are other ways you can increase flexibility that aren't necessarily kind of like just, if you can't, if you don't know where extra money is going to come from, you know, you can, you can play around with things like that. And having that I like to think of it as kind of your floor, knowing your floor, knowing your floor yeah. budget. And if you know what your floor is, um, you don't have to live there all the time, but you just know you have it in your back pocket. You have like, oh no, I know we can live on a, 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 a month and it's it'll be fine. So that's just something that you know that you can go to. But taking all of that into account is is really, really important. Because like that's that's a great example of just like a something that should be super stressful that just did, ended up being a didn't sound like a lot like very stressful at all they were not stressed they, maybe they were but they no i don't actually think they were i was more stressed i think for them yeah than they yeah completely all the stress for you <laughs> well that's fine maybe that's why i was their planner yeah maybe it's like a third <laughs> well, person honest, just to stress a little bit hey yeah. that's a it's like you don't need stress anymore because i am losing my shit about all this <laughs> 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 hair is falling out and then some clients are like you need to stress a little more okay <laughs> like we're gonna work on you stressing out about 15 percent more <laughs> i feel like that's actually a true statement <laughs> <laughs> all right that's all we've got for you today if you liked what you heard head over to itunes and give us a really good rating that really helps people find us that would be awesome and if you loved what you heard why not check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash because money and lend us a little support so we can keep doing what we're doing. I am Chris Entz and you can find me over at rags to reasonable.com. I'd like to thank my partners in crime, Sandy Martin, who you can find at spring financial planning, springplans.ca and John Robertson, who you can find value at simple or his blog blessed by the potato, which is holypotato.net.